Mike Radich here, and I'm now joined on the phone by a very special guest. She's a young lady who appeared in many Western movies and TV shows. Sunset Carson used to call her the queen of the action westerns. So here she is, the queen of the action westerns, Peggy Stewart. Peggy, how are you? Hi, Mike, and hello to everybody else that's listening. (laughs) (laughs) Peggy, today I want to talk to you about your 78-year career in the film industry. You're still going strong, you're still active, you're still a part of the business, so I want to focus mainly on the westerns you made during your career. I want to focus on the cliffhanger serials, the TV shows, and the B-movies that you made in your career. But before we start talking about that, one question I've always wanted to ask you is, what's the role that you're best known for? Me personally, when I think of you and, and, I, and I think of your career and, and I, I see you in, in a different movie or I, I hear your name, I always think of you as Kate Wells in Son of Zorro. For whatever reason, I, I just thought you were fantastic in that serial. I, I, I thought it was a great serial and I thought you had a great performance in that particular serial. So that's the one that I always think of. Whenever I hear your name, whenever I see you, in a movie, I always think back to Son of Zorro. So I'm just curious, when, when you go to Western film festivals and when you go to conventions and when you go to places where fans are at that, that know you and know of the work that you've done over the course of your career, what's the role that they always come up to you and say, hey, you're so-and-so from whatever movie it is. What's the role that you're best known for? I'm very curious about this. Oh, Mike, I, you know, it's the name of one of the Westerns generally. And uh, so I, uh, and the names of them, I don't uh, recall mm-hmm. uh, which one was Sunsets so, or the Red Riders and mm-hmm. so forth. But it's usually just the Western and or the serials, you know, the Marco Zorro. So uh, those uh, are the main ones. The, let me see. Um, yeah, they are. They're the main ones. Once in a while, I get somebody to ask about Twilight Zone. Hmm. Okay, okay. I see, I see. There was one point in time where you actually left acting, and there was a three-year span where you stopped acting because you didn't want to be in any more Westerns. You wanted to try out a different genre. Obviously, you returned to acting and you returned to Westerns. So I'm just curious, looking back on it now, are Westerns your favorite genre to work in? Oh, I adore them. I adore them. And when I wanted to get out of them, uh, leave Republic and, and get back into movies, a movies, you know, where they're like uh, All This in Heaven 2 with Betty Davis and these kind of uh, movies. Um, I really wanted to do that, uh, get back to that. So, uh, But then it didn't happen. I had made a reputation uh, in the westerns and I did not know that and uh, so here all the calls that I got to work were on the westerns again and now as I look back on it and I've gone to the festivals and so forth it truly was the the happiest time of my career I adored them of course I had been riding since I was five years old and I adored being around the horses and I just loved everything about it. I was so dumb. I don't know why I wanted to get out of them. <laughs> <laughs> Peggy, I recently saw an interview you did at this point 30 years ago. And in that interview, you said that at that time, working in Westerns and being a leading lady for Republic Pictures actually helped you get acting jobs at that time. Producers, directors, casting people were very impressed when they looked at your resume and saw that you worked in Westerns and you were a leading lady for Republic. So I'm just curious. Obviously, that was 30 years ago when that interview happened, and it was 30 years ago when you said that, and a lot of things are different now. Some people who are in key positions now in Hollywood probably aren't that familiar with the work you did in the past. So I'm just curious... Does that still work? Does that still help you get acting jobs in 2015? Uh, Not that I was a leading lady at Republic so much, but the Westerns themselves. It depends on uh, Mike, Mm -hmm. uh, the producer, the director, whoever you're interviewing for, how old they are, because a lot of them, you see, don't don't know Mm -hmm. the uh, Red Riders and Sunset and Lash. They were too young. Mm -hmm. 
so uh, they, uh, some of them will go about hop along, and uh, but at any rate, so I have a book, uh, a little paperback that Bob Carmen had made up, and uh, I think the other man, uh, Chaparelli was the other man's name, is, uh, who got a lot of production shots. And uh, they, uh, Bob Brake, uh, he wrote the foreword to it. And so uh, I take that with me. Steve Stevens, my agent, said, take that with you. I said, mm-hmm. Steve, I, you know, I'm, I'm very shy and uh, do not know how to be a salesman for myself. And so uh, I'm fine for other people, but not me. And uh, so I started carrying it with me anyhow. And, uh, of course, the crews and everybody, they're all very, very young. They don't mm-hmm. know these big westerns. And, um, but somebody would spot that little book and start reading, say, is this you? I said, that's me. And they'd start reading, and then they'd show all the pictures that are Western and me riding and doing all the stuff, you know. Mm-hmm. Right. And that interested them very much. So, right. yeah. But that's how it all starts, honey. It really isn't so much, uh, uh, as I say, the, the people not knowing the mm-hmm. be Westerns mm-hmm. because they're too young. Right, right. I hear you. I hear you. Me and my sister, we watched that uh, Adam Sandler movie you were in. Uh, That's my boy. We watched that movie, and you know, I'm only 22, and she's two years younger than me, so she's 20. And when I spotted you in that movie, I'm like, oh my god, that's Peggy Stewart. I know her. And she's like, how do you know her? How do you know her? I'm like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, that's another time I had taken the book uh, with me. I went and I did the interview for that, mm-hmm. and. Uh, I took a little book with me, and I just laid it out on the table there because I, I knew that the uh, director, he knew some of the B westerns and all. He liked the westerns. And uh, they immediately, the younger ones, will go to, oh, how how is that? Do you ever work with Clint Eastwood? With They go up to the newer, right. you know, to their age bracket. Mm-hmm. And I said, no, these are B westerns. Right. So they start looking at the book, and sure enough, they uh, get interested in, in what the B Westerns were. And uh, it was the book, I think, that really uh, got came along and, and uh, they called me back for another interview and uh, got the, and got the part. And then when we were working, we were on location in Cape Cod for mm-hmm. two, uh, about two and a fourth months. And uh, when we were working, I had the, they asked, do you have that book with you? I said, yes, I went in there. So uh, Sean, the director, he wanted one, and, and uh, uh, oh, what's, it, what's the lead guy's name, Andy? Andy Sandberg. And then there was yes. Adam Sandler was the other lead. And he wanted one. Mm-hmm. So anyhow, that gets passed around, and then pretty soon, my daddy used to do this. My dad was a grip on Wyatt Earp, and mm-hmm. I said, right. no fooling, you know. And, <laughs> right. Uh, then sometimes they'll come up and speak about their grandfather or their father, and I and I happened to know them, I, you know. I knew uh, all the crews. We just had so much fun making these things. <laughs> so... It still carries on, right. Mike, one one way or the other. Right, right. Now, James Kahn, he was on that movie. He was in that movie with you. Um, he worked with the Duke in El, one of my favorite westerns, uh, El Dorado. He worked with John Wayne in that movie. Did you Did you two ever reminisce about the old days? No, wow. uh, no. No, uh, Kahn was uh, a little hard to work with. Oh, okay, okay. Now, let's go back to the, the westerns here. I'm just curious, since you've been in many movies and many TV shows, what do you like better, TV or movies? They were all, it would be all the same, excepting for one thing. Movies take forever. They, uh, gosh, in one day you may get, oh, maybe three shots, I mean three scenes. And in uh, the B-Westerns, and especially 
especially on the serials, I've done as many as 102 scenes. So it's a uh, shoot fast, shoot fast, and uh, uh, be western if you didn't if you didn't get the scene uh, in two takes, then forget it. You didn't need that scene anyhow. Throw it out. <laughs> right. <laughs> Right, right. So, in the movies, it's an entirely different thing. They take forever to line up. In fact, I've got a marvelous, marvelous book that's been given to me here on Clint Eastwood. I, he's, I'm a big fan of Clint Eastwood. I only met him one time. But uh, this is um, uh, oh, a retrospective piece. And you really get an insight into him as uh, his thoughts and all, as director and as an actor, too. But he, too, uh, was mentioning, uh, or the man who wrote the book, Robert Schickel, he mentions, too, that Warner Brothers, uh, you know, really have had this long 30-some-odd-year contract, unwritten, never anything but a handshake with mm -hmm. Clint. Uh, because he brings his pictures in uh, on budget or either under budget. Mm -hmm. And the budgets are cheap compared to other uh, people's budgets. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Clint's whole thing is, uh, and the actors, I've heard that many times too from them that have worked with him. He never says cut and he never says, you know, roll them. He says, yeah, whenever you're ready, and the actors will start the scene, and then they just stop, you know, uh, when it's over with, and he walks up quietly to them and says, uh, are you comfortable? Did you like that? And they either yes or no, or they would like to do it one more time. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's it. Mm -hmm. It's usually just one take and move on to the next thing. Right. Yeah, but, uh, oh boy, other movies, no. You'll be on that scene maybe 30, 40, 50 takes. And for what? You know, it's a waste of film. Uh, nothing really it changes that much. Mm -hmm. So that's the big difference to me between uh, B movies and the A movies was the time element. Nowadays, Hollywood isn't making as many westerns as they once did. So I'm just curious, when was the last time you were offered a role in a western film or TV show? Uh, oh, it's been a long time, honey, because they're not making them, you know. Right, they're making right. the A westerns, but I haven't been uh, offered anything in that. Mm -hmm. And uh, they haven't had anything. Right, right. As a matter of fact, for the ones I've seen. Because... Uh, uh, you know, uh, now for me, uh, at my age, I'm 92, and at my age, the uh, roles are few and far between, and when they do come up, then they they go for a name value. Mm -hmm. There are some name values that are still around that around my age too, right? Which you cannot blame them for, you know. Mm -hmm. So you don't get in on. Uh, you know, to meet them or to uh, have an interview. It has to come more or less by who you have worked for before, who you know, and uh, that they ask for you. Mm -hmm. Now, Peggy, changing gears on you a little bit, let's play a game. Well, it really isn't a game, but for lack of a better term, I like to call it a game because I don't know what to call it. The name of the game is called Name Drop. How Name Drop is played is I say the name of an actor that you worked with during your career, and I want you to tell me what your relationship was like with this person, what was it like working with them, and also a story that you think the audience would be interested in hearing about this person if there is a story to be told. Okay, first name up. One of my all-time favorite Western stars, Lash LaRue. What was it like working with Lash LaRue? Oh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, all the Westerns are fun. But, Mike, actually, I didn't get to know Lash until we were on one of the Western festivals mm -hmm. because he and Fuzzy um, 
they they would get off to the side and and discuss the script and what they're going to do and so forth and so they were very serious about that series of his going and so they they worked at it worked at it very hard uh uh the two of them and i let him say i think i did two of lashes or something Mm-hmm. But anyhow, you know, if you start a conversation, he's always friendly. He always a uh, very sweet guy, very sweet guy, mm-hmm. talk with you and so forth. But he would uh, then immediately get with Fuzzy and they'd go sit in their chairs and, and get the script out and look it over and discuss it, you know. Mm-hmm. That was, uh, but it was good, but... I knew so much of there's so many of the crew and everything, right. and the stunt guys uh, on Mike until I was never left in the cold as far as conversation, you know. Right. right. My name is Lash Larue, and this is my partner Fuzzy Jones. I always liked Lash Larue's voice. He had a great voice, didn't he? Yes, he did, and he was just he was a uh, uh, beautiful. Uh, educated guy as far as his poetry was lovely gosh I, you know as on the festivals uh, we sat down had dinner one night and uh, Vash oh, uh, did a few uh, poems for me and they're beautiful they're very deep and uh, on the religious side but uh, they're quite deep and and then we got talking uh, too about uh, oh uh, the Deanna Durbin days. He went with Deanna for a while, and in fact, that's the only one that I know of. I told him that too, that the studio would let her go around. Uh, some of us kids were over under contract to Universal also, but the studio wouldn't let her be around us. Uh, well, I and all they, they was they were making a star out of her, but they let her date Lash, and uh, anyhow, he we just had good deep conversations. That uh, uh, where's your really heart? Where's your soul? You know? Right, right. What do, what do you really love about the business and the things like that and. Uh, it was fun, and he made the, uh, at one restaurant, <laughs> he made the Caesar salad. The guy came up with all the ingredients and everything, he was going to start it, and said, last said, so, well, hang on there a minute, you know. <laughs> and he took the spoons and made the Caesar salad, and it was very good. <laughs> <laughs> but I never saw him... Um, Mm, when he was uh, 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 with the alcohol. I know that uh, could be a problem, but I never saw that. Hmm. Or either he hid it very well, right. one of the two, you know. Right. He was just outspoken, whether alcohol was involved or not. He said it the way it was. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I always enjoyed hearing him speak in all those movies. He has a great voice. Um, now, you worked with Roy Rogers, and you worked with Gene Autry, and they're known for being singing cowboys, but I don't recall you ever singing in any of those movies. I recall you singing in a movie that you did with Lash LaRue in 1948, a movie called Frontier Revenge. Is that the only movie you ever sang in? Yes, it is. Thank goodness I was petrified. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a singer. Ron Orman, the man who directed and had put the shows on with Lash. Oh, my gosh. When he said, Peg, now you sing this song, I said, I do what? (laughs) 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 Uh, That would scare me to death. (laughs) So, and prancing around those tables in the bar, I remember that. I felt like a fool. (laughs) But anyway... Uh, to answer your question, no, I'm not a singer. Republic sent me out on a road show uh, like they used to do, uh, I guess maybe still do, uh, send you out to, to do one night stands, two night stands, and advertising the films more or less, you know. So I went out with the Broom Brothers and... Um, They were very good, very nice, and sang, I think, Mike, I sang Mule Train (laughs) (laughs) and uh, Powder Your Face with Sunshine 
wrote his two songs. And when he came back home, I had a, just an old-fashioned radio big troller in the house. And the Broom Brothers, Gary, said, why don't you cut, cut? a song, cut the song, right. Mule Train. Uh, the reason I picked Mule Train was because Calamity Jane drove it for two years, and I loved uh, uh, a Calamity Jane type woman mm -hmm. to do that. And so anyhow, I said, well, oh, for gosh sakes. Well, we sat in my living room, and the Broom Brothers and me, and we cut a dinky little record, and they took it and sent it out to Decca Records. Well, bless goodness if I, about two or three weeks later, uh, I don't get a call or, or a letter from Carl Records, which was a subsidiary of Decca, saying, asking if I would do four sides for them. And I almost fainted, Mike. I said, four sides? So down I go to... Decca Records, and uh, uh, they show me what they want me to do. Uh, the songs I'd never heard of them, they, of course, cowboy western mm -hmm. songs. And that's the end of it. I had right. never heard any more right. from those records at all. Right, right, right. <laughs> so that was my big career singing. <laughs> <laughs> now, Peggy, let's go from the King of the Bullwhip to the King of the Cowboys. What was it like working with Roy Rogers? Uh, well, it was very nice, but I didn't actually work with Roy. I made uh, Utah, and then when they had their television show, mm -hmm. I did right. uh, mm -hmm. one or two of those. Right, right. I actually uh, worked with Dale. Right. There was Dale, and it's always Dale and Roy, right. you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was my work with her, mainly. And uh, I, I didn't do hardly anything with Roy himself. A little bit with the uh, ca uh, Sons of the si Pioneers, right? But uh, so, but you know, Roy is very sweet, very nice as far as a person. He's a very sweet guy, right? Audrey was different. I worked with Gene, mm -hmm. and uh, we we used to kid each other all the time. He started calling me mother, and I don't know why. <laughs> and uh, he'd say, "Oh, there's Mother Stewart." Oh. And so, but anyhow, uh, his cameraman, Brad, Bill Bradford, I used to date Bill on occasions, and so Gene and Brad and I would go over into Hollywood and uh, watch the uh, Hollywood Angels, I think they were called Hollywood something, mm -hmm. stars, Hollywood stars play baseball at the Gilmore Stadium, and we had lots of fun. Yeah, mm -hmm. Gene, Gene had a good sense of humor. We played a lot, you know. Right. But we worked hard, too. Right, right. We've talked about the King of the Bullwhip. We've talked about the King of the Cowboys. Now let's talk about the King of the Bad Men, Roy Barcroft. He's one of my all-time uh, favorites. Barcroft. What was it like working I with him? I have never in my life known a man that's done so much, Mike. I used to, uh, Roy asked if we would go work at night, and all we go over to eat and across the street from the studio and grab dinner and talk. And, uh, then... He, uh, Roy and Tom London and uh, myself, we all lived within a few blocks of each other. So it was like a little triangle. So I went over to Roy's and Vera's house one night, and uh, out in his uh, little backyard patio, uh, he had a, a, a shed that was over the patio that was uh, cemented. But in the cement, there was a square. And he goes and lifts that square up. It was a block of cement. And here are steps going down into, like, a basement. Mm -hmm. No homes out here ever have basements. And uh, that's where Vera kept salt and all of this other stuff. I think she was from... Utah, I think she was Mormon, mm -hmm. and uh, kept all of her stuff and what have you. But Roy said it was his doghouse, too, right. because he loved to play the saxophone, and he'd go down there and play saxophone. So 
it would bother anybody in the house. But he uh, had an orchestra, Barcross Orchestra. It was, uh, I think, a 10-piece or 10-piece or 12-piece orchestra that uh, he went traveling with and what have you for several years. So he did that. He played the saxophone. Uh, then he was uh, on a Russian freighter mm -hmm. for about a year and a half or two years, working a Russian freighter out there in the ocean. Uh, he worked in Northern California on a sheep farm for the same amount of time, uh, two, two and a half. And he, he talks about it like, yeah, you know, he just takes it in his stride, right. easy going, that guy with that very sly, dirty smile of his. Right. And uh, let's see, the sheep farm, and then, ah, then, uh, then he turned actor or turned republic. I don't know how he got his contract or... Mm -hmm. started acting. Mm -hmm. But have you ever heard such a variety of stuff? He could do anything. he just pick up and do it. Yeah, yeah. He's one of my all-time favorites. I, I love... Uh, if, if anything I see on TV has him in it, I'm watching it. I, I just really enjoy the guy's work. Yeah. Yeah, he's great. And he had a little camper uh, that he would uh, take every patient. When we did the Way West, uh, we were up in... Oregon for about two months, I guess, mm -hmm. and uh, here's Roy with his, they give you a nice room, the studio does, at a motel or wherever, and he had a nice room, but he'd stay in his camper, and the camper was filled with boxes that were full of production shots, because Roy had been there at the studio a long time, mm -hmm. and... Um, in one production shot, he called me, he says, uh, come here, I want to show you something. So we went, uh, I went and looked at this picture, and out of every single one, it, uh, in those days they used to take a picture of the whole crew, mm -hmm. and uh, the, the actors too. So in that particular picture, every single person in it had already passed on, with the exception of Roy, uh, Andy McLaughlin, who was like a kid at that time, Andy, Roy, and and uh, Tommy Coleman, the prop man, three of them that were left. All the rest had already passed on. I said, my God, Roy, right, you know. I said, you're an old man. <laughs> <laughs> Right. He said, "You're no spring chicken." <laughs> <laughs> so, but he and uh, Mitchum were very close friends because Bob, I guess, started was doing extra work at Republic when uh, Roy was still there. Was there rather? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, the two of them take their bedrolls and go out on the desert there, at Bend, Oregon, sleep out in the the desert. Mm -hmm. They had nice rooms, but <laughs> right. there they go. Right. I liked Barcroft, Bar too. Right. I heard that he was the nicest guy ever, even though he was Republic's number one bad guy. Everyone who ever worked with him said that he was one of the nicest guys in the business. Would you agree right. with that? Yeah, right. He was. You're just a sweetheart. Yeah. Yeah. One of my, so, my all-time favorites. Yes. Soft-spoken and good humor. Mm -hmm. You had to have humor to be at Republic. Right, right. Because, uh, as I say, we worked very hard, all of us. But uh, uh, we were forever playing jokes on each other, mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. Not just in the show that you were on, but if you had a few minutes off, you'd run over to stage line and do something wrong over there <laughs> on Dale's set. Right. <laughs> you know, uh, right. or the cereal. Uh, right. Wilkie was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Bob Wilkie. Mm -hmm. He was another nice guy. Mm -hmm. right. But Barcroft was my pet. And, and I, all I remember one day, with all of us living so close and so close to the studio, uh, my little 40 Ford I had was uh, in the shop. I didn't have a ride to the studio. Mm -hmm. And the studio was, I guess, about 12 blocks away. 
Mm-hmm. So Barker said, I'll pick you up. And I said, okay. So here it was at about quarter to six in the morning, and I hear the funny little beepy horn. Right. And I said, uh, I yelled, you know, I'm coming. So anyhow, I go outside and I'm looking for the car. And no, it's his motorcycle. And it's raining cats and dogs. Right. So here we go, bark off to me in the studio, raining cats and right. dogs. <laughs> and I had to drive when I got there, and of course the hair, and had to go through the routine of curling it and going under the hair dryer and all of that. <laughs> so, but that was my ride to the studio, was on his motorbike. Right. I'm a very big fan of Roy Barcroft. I think he's the greatest Western black hat who ever lived. I think he's great in everything I've seen him in. I can't name one bad performance he's had. I'm a very big fan of him. Next up, Sunset Carson. What was it like working with Sunset Carson? Mmm. I loved him. Yeah. I just adored oh say because uh, he used to call me baby sister. There was a uh, one of the pictures we did. He was in jail, and I went to get him out of jail. But to do that, I dressed like a uh, his little sister oh. with pigtails and stuff. <laughs> so from that time on, he always called me baby sister. But uh, Mick and I had uh, just a good rapport. We we had uh, wonderful times together, and and his uh, personal life, mm-hmm. you know, he'd always call me when he was right. having trouble with his personal life, right? And uh, I'd fuss at him. Right. He backed his. Uh, he had it like a. It was bigger than a pickup truck, but it it was like a whole little house, a little roof on it, and everything on the back of his truck. Uh, he had it built, and up on Ventura Boulevard at the time, uh, across the street from the studio, was uh, Herbert's Drive-In, and in the back of the drive-in, there was a bar. So a certain group of uh, Republic people, uh, the Pioneers and Roy and uh, no, John Carroll and all mm-hmm. that. They go to the Herberts to right. the bar, and Sunset wasn't working at the time, so of course he went to the bar. Mm-hmm. And uh, he, he and when he wasn't working, he could get into trouble, pretty good trouble with that drinking. But anyhow, he calls me, and with that extra Texas accent, he would always talk to me like. Uh, my name was Peggy, P A G G Y instead of Peggy. Peggy, and you know, he says, "Yeah," he said, "I back my truck off the bridge here at Laurel Canyon, close to Ventura Boulevard. Mm-hmm. There was a bridge, and the wash was not wide like it is now. It was only just uh, oh, about ten feet wide, maybe, if that, mm-hmm. and uh, ten deep." So I said, well, you backed your truck off the bridge. It had a, you know, a, a wall up there. You know, well, anyhow, I live just two and a half blocks from there. So I walk over to see what, and sure enough, the whole back end of the truck, I don't know how it was hanging there, mm-hmm. was off that bridge and the front end up, standing up. It was just hanging there, Mike. So, of course, the police came and everything. And here's Sunset in one of those Alaskan wool coats, thick wool coat, sweating up a storm. And it was only about 85 degrees outside. Right. What he was doing with that coat on, I don't know. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> and he came on over to the house. And Mom Chase, who was taking care of Michael, my son, uh, you know, she loved him, too. Mm -hmm. So I was moving at the time from that particular house over on uh, to another one close by. And I had packed some crystal ware and all of that in a flimsy kind of a box. 
And Seth says, picking that up, and it's wobbly. I said, Sonny, put that down for God's sake, you know. I got goddamn Peggy. I'll take care of it. I'll put it in the car for you. Mm. Right. <laughs> <laughs> <So> <laughs> he did, and sure enough, we didn't break a single piece. That, that, that threw me for a loop. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they got his truck fixed, I guess. And... Let me see, Bob Brown, Bob Brown, who did a lot of leather work uh, for Ed, uh, forget his name, big guy out here, did a lot of Ed leather work. But Bob Brown really took care of Sunset. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He housed him and tried to keep him sober, and especially when he was going to go to work in the morning. Mm -hmm. So... But I adored him. He was the sweetest, most wonderful kid in the world. Next up, he was one of the actors who portrayed Red Rider, Alan Rocky Lane. What was it like working with Alan Rocky Lane? Oh, my God. My old, old bubble butt, I called him. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Yeah. No, that was no fun. Alan didn't have a sense of humor. At least not when he was working, not on mm. the pictures. Maybe he did off of them. Mm. But uh, it was just wrong all the way around. That started, oh, I was about 15, I guess, years old. And my mom, she uh, was uh, had a date for that night. And Pat, my sister, and I, we didn't know who the, the date was. So we had all belonged to Lakeside Country Club over mm -hmm. here. So we figured, well, it was somebody from Lakeside. And uh, so the date comes and knocks on the door, and very nice-looking guy and so forth. And he's a car salesman. So anyhow, Mom has her date. And years go by, years go by, and uh, I'm at Republic, and... The long street from the front of the, uh, on Radford Street, mm -hmm. you could look straight down the, this one street to the back lot and see the western street and see people that are working. Right. Well, uh, my call usually for makeup was always around six o'clock in the morning, so I get ready and uh, get over there and um, starting to go over to make up and I see Alan walking down towards the back back lot to the Western Street and uh, so I, I yelled to him, hey bubble butt, because he was forever, forever, he'd hold you up for an hour discussing his wardrobe <laughs> and it bothered him very much that he had should I have a dark shirt and light pants, or should I have dark pants and a light shirt? Uh, oh. And the, the pants, when you put the shaps on, would they wrinkle? Uh, did it look bad? Uh, I tell you, he keep you forever. <laughs> and his ego was something else. So that's how Bubble Butt had started when he had those shaps on. And those pants would wrinkle. Oh. And... Uh, so he called me over anyhow after I yelled, hey, Bubba, what? And uh, he said, Peggy, I don't appreciate you calling me that. And I said, oh, oh, I'm <laughs> sorry, okay. And went on to make up. Oh. That's about it. Oh, I see. Uh, oh, yeah. We, I was doing the show with him at the time. Mm -hmm. I think it was uh, the next day, all of a sudden... It dawned on me he was working, and I, in the scene, and I don't know if it was his profile or what, but I realized, Mike, he was the car salesman that years mm. ago had dated my mom. Okay, okay. I was waiting for the, the tie-in, because I, I thought you were going there. I thought that he was going to be the car salesman. So, okay, he was the car salesman. Did he remember he you? He was the car salesman, and I told him that. I said, Alan, <laughs> I said, it just come to me, you know. You right. dated my mom. Right. Well, of course, that didn't help me get in oh. any better either. <laughs> oh. Calling him bubble butt and oh. telling the world that. Oh. So, yeah. 
Mm-hmm. So now we got we just <laughs> we just did class mm-hmm. one way or another. Mm-hmm. I see. You know, didn't have much to say to each other or okay. anything. Okay. Did he remember your mom? I sure I don't know. Okay. He wouldn't let me know. Okay. But I'm sure. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Next up, another actor who portrayed Red Rider, Wild Bill Elliott. What was it like working with Wild Bill Elliott? Wonderful. Wonderful. Bill was the greatest guy, uh, I tell you. He was very, very subtle. Very subtle. And uh, uh, the prop man, Joe LaBella, he says, you ought to watch this guy. Uh sometimes see how subtle he is uh, bill loved to make a play for the girls and uh, he was so subtle with it you could hardly tell that that's what it was a play for the girls mm-hmm. and uh, he called me and asked well actually uh yeah he called and asked me to be queen of the rodeo up in new hall one time so i said well i will but i said i haven't got anything bill to but my old Justin boots I was wearing on all the westerns, and I said the leather at the toes even is got holes in it. So he uh, came by and said, I'll come by and pick you up. I said, okay. So he came by the house and took me up on Sherman Way. I think it Romy was the name of the guy, and had a pair of boots made. I, no, I think they're the ones that are in the Lone Pine Museum. I worn for a long time, uh, black boots. So, but anyway, I uh, go to, I said, I have, you know, a horse. Mm-hmm. And he said, don't worry about it. He said, I've got a nice little mare. She just is as lively as she can be. And uh, said, she'd be fine. So I get up to New Hall, and I mount up, of course, and I take the mare out to feel her out a little bit and she was just hang doggy the head down no spirit to her at all I brought her back and I said Bill you got some spurs and he said well I told him I, he said don't worry about it she'll hear that music start up and you just be surprised and I said oh okay so of course the big line up for the march around the rodeo and all and uh, then you line up, and then the announcer announces your name and so forth, and then you wave your hat and tear us out to the front of the whole thing. And uh, they call my name, and nothing happened. I kicked this mare. I kicked mm-hmm. her. Nothing. She just stood there. <laughs> just stood right. Well, pretty soon, Bill, he's sort of laughing and the other group of the lineup had already moved up towards the front now the audience starts to laugh and finally I realized she's all stretched out and she's urinating just <laughs> having a good old time urinating Right. so here I am sitting there by myself Elliot finally he just left <laughs> he thought she'd never finish he just left and went up to the front of the line and he says when I get up there finally she finishes and I wave my hat and tear up to the front of the line too and Bill's up there laughing and my his laughter his he's hysterical just hysterical is an intake of breath it was <laughs> <laughs> that that is real laughter for Elliot. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> but it's silly things like that that come to my mind. I remember about mm-hmm. these people because it was so fun. It right. really was. Right, right. <laughs> Next up, another actor who, like Roy Barcroft, I haven't seen him in any bad things that that I've watched that he made during his career. He's one of my all-time favorites. Not as well-known as the other names that I've just listed off, but definitely a great actor and, and someone I really enjoy watching. Lane Bradford. What was it like working with Lane Bradford? Oh, Lane. I didn't know him very well. Okay. I, I did make a couple of pictures with him. and He was with the boys, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, all of them get together and talk and so forth. And 
And the name was very nice. I don't know a thing about him, really. Okay. Okay. Uh, his father, yes, John Meston yes, yep. or something like John that. Merton. Merton. Yeah, yeah, that's him. You worked with him yeah. as well. Yeah. Uh, yeah, right. I worked with him when I did Lane. Mm-hmm. So, I, as I say, I really didn't know Lane outside. He mm-hmm. seemed to be a nice enough guy. Mm-hmm. Did you know John Merton well? Did you know Lane's dad? Did you know him well, or better than Lane? Uh, no. Oh, okay. No, I just worked with him more. Right. Okay. A lot of these people you that were not with the studio itself, mm. they uh, you work with them, but they get off to groups of their own. Mm. Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, just out of curiosity, who was the better actor since you worked with both men, Lane Bradford or John Merton? I say Lane Bradford. What do you say? It's kind of hard to say, because Merton could be a ham, Mm -hmm. a real ham, Mm -hmm. old-time ham, you Mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. So if you calmed him down, I imagine he'd be very fine. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, They, I I don't know. I really don't. Okay. Okay. I didn't see enough of them, uh, only in Westerns, you know. So I've got nothing really to compare it against. Oh, okay, okay. When I found out Lane Bradford was John Merton's son, I was very surprised. I couldn't believe it. I I don't really see a resemblance between the two of them. Do you see a resemblance? Because I don't think they look alike at all. No. No. Not at all. No. He must look like his mom. I was surprised, too. Yeah. I don't know. He must look like his mom. Yeah. I don't know. But anyways, moving on. Now, here's a guy I know you worked with and I know you know very well. Jock Mahoney. What was it like working with Jock Mahoney? Yeah, Jocko. Jocko and I went together for about, uh, it was about a year. A year. Mm-hmm. We did it. And uh, I always said he looked like he was on bailing wire. I never saw anybody so light-footed in my life to be as, as uh, tall as he was. Right. And Davy Sharp broke uh, Jocko in. So... Uh, Charlie Starrett, doing one of his westerns, mm-hmm. was the first time uh, I met Jocko. He, we had a ride with a posse coming down a hill and stopping right slap dab in front of the camera and then firing the gun off camera. So uh, we came tearing down this hill, and uh, I was a little bit ahead of Jock. Stop in front of the camera, fire the gun, and so forth. So that scene's over with, and and I didn't know it was Jocko. It was a masked man. Right. So I'd never met Starrett either. Mm -hmm. So uh, anyhow, the masked man says, you you know how to ride, don't you? And I said, yeah, a little bit. So I went on over to the truck where the horses are to talk to John Goodwin, the wrangler, that I adored, and uh, I asked him, I said, who's that guy down there? He said, which one? I said, the one that has the mask on. He said, that's Jock Mahoney. He doubles Charlie Starrett. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, uh uh-huh. So I guess about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, uh, I hadn't talked to him, I'd ridden with him again or Mm -hmm. anything. Uh, Here comes with the mask off, and he was a good-looking guy. Um, the mask off, here comes this guy in the Durango suit outfit, and he walks up to me and he says, so where are we having dinner? I, I said, a big pardon? He said, where are we having dinner? <laughs> and it caught me so by surprise, I said, I don't know, Let him, you know, go to a drive-in. So we went out and had a bite of dinner together, and from that point on, we started going steady. We went steady for about a year, got engaged, so so called, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, then one night, uh, Jocko says, uh, "Let's have it. let's have dinner. I've got something to tell you." I said, "Okay." So in the meantime, I had done an Army Air Force show up here or north here and met Buck, Buck Young, uh, my husband. So uh, Jocko said, says, 
that he said, uh, I've met a, a girl, which was Margaret Fields. Mm -hmm. And right. uh, I said, you ha I said, uh. oh, Jocko, I've got to tell you, I met a boy. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so we broke up our so-called engagement. Each mm -hmm. one of us married those mm -hmm. people. Right, right. <laughs> yeah. And... Uh, Jack and I remained like brother and sister from that time on. Mm -hmm. When I uh, went to work as a casting director for NBC, mm -hmm. he uh, came carrying the office one day. My desk was up towards the front, and I was standing up, and he came carrying, he picks me up, he says, Hi, you diddy. And I <laughs> said, Oh, my God. God, Chuck, because nobody in the office knew who he was, you know. Right. Uh, this, his mother and I, too, were very close, very close. Right. Uh, Jock introduced me to Eastern philosophy, and uh, uh, his mother and, and Jock and I, we used to sit at the kitchen table there at uh, his house, and he'd eat a loaf and a half of bread, one fell swoop. No dinner, just bread. <laughs> and uh, he would sit there and talk all these theologian type things. I was fascinated. I'd never heard the word even of reincarnation. Mm -hmm. And he was telling me all about that. And, my gracious. His life was something else. Mm -hmm. He and Maggie married, as I said, and they had uh, Princess, a baby. Then uh, pretty soon uh, they got divorced, and then Jocko married Autumn Russell, and uh, they didn't get divorced. They moved to Washington, the state of Washington. Mm -hmm. oh, and... He met some girl down here that he was coming down to see on occasions. Mm. So Autumn knew about it, of course. Mm. She, you know, she, they were free souls. Mm. Okay, they didn't play that out, right. whatever it was. Right, right. And uh, he had a, a heart attack. That was it. His first one was down here. It was so surprising because he was such a good stunt man. Mm. Oh, yeah. Yakima Kanat is the greatest stuntman in the history of film, in my opinion. I think he's phenomenal. But Jock Mahoney, he's right behind him. Jock Mahoney is a great stuntman. He can fight. He can ride. He can do backflips. He can dive over horses. He can, he can do everything. He, he's a great stuntman. And like you said, for someone his size to move the way he does is just incredible. And those are the, the two best stuntmen that I've ever seen. Those are the two that I like the most. Would you agree? It was a, in the top ones, as far as I'm yeah, concerned. Yeah. I never... You know, you know, you can sit and watch a stuntman work, mm -hmm. and you can sort of be holding your breath and hoping they hit the X mark that they marked off or mm -hmm. do their stunt without getting hurt. And uh, But with Jock and, and Davey, you just sat relaxed. Mm -hmm. You were there to see a good show yeah. Yeah. and uh, a wonderful, beautiful stunt, you know? Yeah, yeah. There's never any doubt, no doubt. You know, Yak I never considered as in the group of stuntmen because he was the daddy of all the stuntmen. Mm -hmm. He started the whole bloody thing. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, well, that's it. They called him the daddy of the stuntmen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Nell and, and Larry Floyd, people who are uh, part of the owners or uh, put on the Williamsburg Film Festival, uh, they come out and stay with me in October for about a month, and we all go to Lone Pine. So uh, Larry, when he comes out, he goes and stays with Joe. Joe's got a house that's up in the mountains uh, outside of Santa Barbara someplace. Mm -hmm. I've never seen it. And so he, Larry goes up there and stays with Joe. Well, this one time he had been up there, and so he was coming home, coming back down here. And uh, 
uh, he came in the living room and he said, oh, he said, Joe's coming. And I said, could not? And he said, yeah, because I'd never seen Joe. I'd seen Tag before, but I'd never seen Joe. So he came in through the back door, and there's a hallway here at my house that walks straight to the living room. So I heard the back door open, and I start to go back and, and meet him. And here's this big six-foot-something guy, huge man. And I just gasped, Mike. He is the twin of Yak. Mm -hmm. The twin of him. I said, I didn't even say hello. I said, let me see your hands. He put his hand up, and I thought I was shaking the accent. They're huge. They're huge. And I said, Joe, you are your daddy. And he said, yeah, I know. He's a very quiet kind of a guy. Yeah. And uh, when he left the house, the front door, he came back in. He said, I, li I like your statue up on the mantel there. I said, the Remington, it's the rearing horse mm -hmm. of uh, Remington's. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> I said, thank you, Joe. Right. I haven't, uh, I haven't seen him since. I, he did the festival down there for Larry and Nell at Williamsburg. Right. And Mel says he was very good at talking to the audience and all for such a guy that seems so shy and quiet. He's got very few words. Right. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Peggy, can you do the duties of a wife? The duties of... <laughs> oh, my gosh. That I did a NCIS, and uh, I... I knew Mark Harmon's mother you know, very well, Elise Knox, and uh, knew her just before she married Tom Harmon. It was years ago. Well, I had never met Tom, uh, Mark. So anyhow, I'm in the makeup chair, and Mark comes into the makeup, and uh, he comes over, he said, Peg, I'm Mark Harmon. I said, you sure are. And... Uh, he starts talking and talking westerns, and evidently, he said, you know, uh, asking me about different cowboys, he said, Don Barry gave me my very first job in this whole business. Right. He said he saw me at Schwab's drugstore, and he had a western series, and he got me a job the first time. He said, uh, did you ever work with Don? Do you know Don? I said, yeah. I said, he, he was, I was married to right. him. Right. Well, he just blushed, and I bet you at least six times during the day shoot, he came up, oh, Peg, I'm so sorry, <laughs> I'm so embarrassed. I said, Mark, please, that's years and years ago. Right. <laughs> right. So, but, um, Don, I was in Hollywood High School. Right. And yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, still in high school. Right. Let's see, my junior year I hadn't started my senior year yet. And uh, let me see, how did I don't know how we met? But anyhow, the phone rings mm -hmm. one night, and Don would always, even the, the years after. He would always clear his throat uh, before he'd say his name. And so I picked the phone up and said, hello. And he said, <coughs> Peggy, Don Barry. Oh, hey, hello. Oh, I know how we met. Yeah, uh, Jean Lucius, one of the girls at high school, uh, said, Don Barry's going to take us all to Piggly Wiggly for some ice cream. Who wants to go? Mm -hmm. So there were four of us that wanted to go. Well, Don had a coupe. This was like a business coupe, no back seat. Right. So here I am lying down on that back part of the with the window, all curled up back there, and we get out, and we go in Piggly Wiggly, and we have mm -hmm. ice cream. And then he was finished, and he left us back off at school. Mm -hmm. Well, where Mom and my sister and I lived, I, I walked to school. It was not far. And um, that's how we met. Mm -hmm. So with, then when he called and uh, uh, this one night, right. he wanted to know if I would go to the preview right, of right. premiere yes. of his film. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, one of his films at the studio. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, wait a minute, I have to ask my mother. So I asked mom, she says, as long as you're home by 10. Mm -hmm. So I told Don that, he said, oh yeah, that'll be fine. So where do we go but Republic Studios into the uh, uh, room where they show the rushes, the day's work, there's one other person in there, Mike. Nobody right. else in there. <laughs> right. So we watched this Western. It was a serial. In fact, it was a Red Rider serial. Mm -hmm. And uh, then he takes me home. Well, we've had, had several dates after that, always with his good friend, Lou Appleton, who was an AD over at Columbia. Mm -hmm. And uh, we go to Jimmy Fiddler's house, or name it. It was always something to do with the business. And finally, I come home from school one day, and books in hand, and I open the door to the apartment, and Don is standing up. He's there, and Mother's there. And I was surprised. And uh, he stands up, and no hello, no nothing. Thank you. Yeah. Can you do the duties of a wife? <laughs> and I, you don't challenge me, Mike. Right. right. <laughs> I, well, of course, who couldn't, right. you know? Right. I didn't know the first thing about it. Mm -hmm. So, anyhow, that's uh, next thing I knew, I was swept up in a whirlwind, getting a trousseau, going to get married at the Little Church of the Flowers over mm -hmm. here on Paris Lawn. And my grandmother and father are coming out from Florida, granddad, oh, the whole big thing. I was in a fog. Real fog. I just, I had no idea, you know, what was happening. And I had opened my big mouth and I didn't know how to get out of it. So Don and I got married and uh, uh, we were married three, about three and a half years, I guess. Had a baby during that time, Michael. And yeah, mm -hmm. that was the end of that long series. So I was married twice. Mm -hmm. Buck was my second husband. Right. right. And uh, we were married when, uh, one week before he passed, yeah, uh, it would have been 50 years. So we had a nice marriage. Right. And during all of this time, uh, Don McCall and Don and his wife, they were at Bucks and my wedding, and we were just always friends. But he never stopped. <coughs> Peggy, Don. <laughs> 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 yes, sir. Well, I was so... When I was 15, I was actually 13. Uh, uh, the maturity had not mm. set in. Okay. So my sister was the dead opposite. She was two years ahead of herself, and I was two years behind mm -hmm. myself. Okay, okay. Yeah. Peggy, let's change gears a little bit and get back to talking about you. Now, you always wanted to do this. You always wanted to be an actress. You you always wanted to be in this business. So can you remember back to, to the when the first time you, you thought about wanting to do this? Is there is there a certain actress that you, that you watched or a certain movie that you watched and you said to yourself, hey. Absolutely. The, okay. Absolutely. The, uh, it wasn't uh, that I wanted to be an actress. I didn't know what that really mm -hmm. was. I was okay. seven years old, mm -hmm. and I had gone to see Little Women with Catherine Hepburn. Mm -hmm. And that, from that time on, she had always been my, uh, I've been a true fan. I absolutely adore her. But, and uh, anyhow, in the film, she faints. Mm -hmm. She does this wonderful twirl and floats to the floor. And I thought, that's what I want to do. And uh, it was so athletically perfect. <laughs> and I didn't think about acting. Uh, that's what I want to do. And I didn't know where you learned to do it or anything else. I didn't think any more about it. And uh, when I was 12, Mother says that uh, we're going to California to see your uncle's wedding. Mm -hmm. So my two sisters know uh, that. And I said, I don't want to go there. And 
had my older sister and I had always, in the summertime, gone to the YWCA camp up in Tallulah Falls, Georgia. I wanted to go to camp. Mother said, no. He says, we're going out to California. So out to California we came, and my grandmother was already out here. And uh, so I asked her, uh, we called her Biggie. Mm -hmm. I said, Biggie, can I go to a school, a dramatic school, acting school while I'm out here? She said, all right. So I went to Neely Dixon's dramatic school during the summer. And then when it was time to go back to Atlanta, I didn't want to go. And so mother and my two sisters went. She said, you better ask your grandmother if she will stay with them. Otherwise, you have to go back home. So Grandma said she would, and the two of us uh, stayed out here. And in the apartment house where we lived, uh, a wonderful character actor, Henry O'Neill, lived there, and Benita Grandel and the Mock Twins. So Pop O'Neill, he was loaned out from Warner Brothers, where he was under contract, to Paramount to do Wells Fargo with Joe McCray and Francis D. And uh, uh, Frank Lloyd, the director, was looking for a girl, young girl, 15, 16, somewhere around there, with a slight southern accent to play their daughter. That looked a little bit like Francis D. So Papa O'Neill suggested, told him about me, he said, I don't know if she can act or not. That's what she's studying. So Paramount at that time had what they called the glass cage. It was a cage, glassed in little stage. And you go and you read a scene for whoever's sitting out there to watch it. And I did that, and they said, wonderful, fine. So that's how I got my first job. Pop O'Neill really mm -hmm. gave it to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just moved on from there, from Paramount over to Universal for four pictures, and into Warner Brothers for a couple of, it was never under contract to the studio, it was uh, for a certain amount of film. Mm -hmm. Your birth last name is O'Rourke, but when your mother and father got divorced, your mother married a man with the last name Stewart. So I'm just curious, how did you get Stewart to be your stage name? Was it when your mother married this man with the last name Stewart, he adopted you and your name became Stewart? Or was it something where a manager, an agent, a producer, a director, an executive, a studio said, hey, we don't like O'Rourke, we want you to change your name and you just pick Stewart because it sounded good, you know, Peggy Stewart has a nice ring to it. I'm just curious, how exactly did Stewart become your stage name? Well, I, I was with an agent, Mitch Hamelberg, mm -hmm. and uh, he says, O'Rourke is a, uh, sounds like a song, Peggy O'Rourke. This is before Rip Torn and all those funny names came in. Right. So he wanted to change the name. Well, we tried and uh, talked to him. Uh, Matt Campbell was my grandmother's name, Peggy Matt Campbell, and uh, Peggy Long. Long was a name in the family, too, and they, none of it fit. So mother was married at the time to John Stewart, and uh, I said, Pe uh, Peggy Stewart. And Biggie said, well, we'll have to write to John Stewart and see if he will adopt you in name only. Mm -hmm. So that's what happened. He adopted me in name only when I was already out here. And I picked up Stewart. Mm. Okay, okay. I see, I see. I was just curious about that. Now, is it true that when you divorced... Don Redberry, that's when you got the contract for Republic, or or did that already were you already working for Republic when when you were married? To no, him? I wasn't at okay. Republic. Okay. It was about uh, oh no, I don't know if I, but the divorce had become final or not. I think it had. Uh, anyhow, Don uh, had talked to Yates. They were, you know, they always used a, an outside girl to. Uh, come in and do the westerns because mm -hmm. Linda Sterling right. and Dale mm -hmm. Helen Talbot and Adele Mara 
I think were the only ones that were under contract at that time to Republic. And um, Lind carried all the cereals and stuff. Right. And westerns. So anyhow, Don said, talked to Pop the AC. He said, well, I'm going to try to use Peggy. He said, she's a fine little actress and she rides and uh, all of that. So they said, yeah, okay. So I went and did my first film, which was uh, Elliot in Tucson Radio- Raiders. It was a Red Rider. Right. Mm-hmm. And they liked me, so they put me under contract. Mm-hmm. Now, you just mentioned Linda Sterling, one of my all-time favorites, and Dale Evans, and some of the other women who worked at Republic during the same time that you were working for Republic. So I'm just curious, because the way the plots of these serials and these B-movies at Republic, the way they're set up, really there's only room for one woman. Whoever the female lead is, is basically the only woman in the movie, the way the way things are set up, the way they had it set up at, at that time, in very very rare circumstances, there's two women in, in a movie. It, it's usually just uh, the female lead, and, and and that's it as far as the women go. So I'm just curious, the other women who were working at Republic, obviously you worked with Dale in the past, but the other women, did you know them? Were you friends with them? You know, what exactly was your relationship like with the women who worked at Republic during the same time you worked there? Linda and I were friends, mm-hmm. uh, and, and none of us had the time, right. like, to be friends outside right. of the studio. Sure. Sure. We were all always working, and right. uh, when I first started at Republic, work days were five days, I mean, six days a week. Saturday was a work day, and then the ruling came in with the SAG making it a golden time, so it was only from Monday to Friday. Uh, <coughs> Linda, let's see, on these Western festivals at uh, uh, Tennessee, hmm, what was it, uh, Memphis. Memphis, yes. <coughs> Tennessee was my right. first festival, mm-hmm. and um, Packy Smith and Mitch Shopper Carter, they were the three that put it on, and Wayne Lackey. So, anyhow, Sunset called me. And uh, wanted me to do, to do a festival. I said, what? And he explained it down in Memphis. I said, Mickey, I said, I, I don't want to do that. I said, 20 some odd years has gone by. I said, people will remember me. Because it always surprised me anyhow that they knew who the hell I was. And um, uh, he said, yes, they will. And with that, he puts Packy on. And Packy tells me, and I, and I finally said, okay. So that's when I did my first festival, and of course it was just total shock for about two days of the festival that these people wanting your autograph and and had these pictures of you, all the stuff that happens at the festival, I was just in shock. So anyhow, uh, I had done a couple of the festivals, and uh, they needed wanted some Western girls. So Linda was the first one I called, and Mm -hmm. she was the same as me. Oh, no, they won't know, you know. So that festival went went by. The next year I called her again and explained it to her and said, I know exactly what you're thinking and going through. So she decided she would do it. Well, my God, of course, people went crazy seeing Mm her. And uh, then I did Helen. Talbot, mm-hmm. and she was the same exact thing, and uh, people certainly knew her, uh, loved her when she got down to Memphis. Right. And uh, but Linda and I, uh, um, no, we didn't socialize together. We had uh, new same people, Jim Yarbrough. Or one of the script boys there. He was good friends with Linda, mm-hmm. and I knew good Jim too. He was good mm-hmm. friends with me. And then Sloan Nibley, her husband, a boy I used to date, uh, Jim Jim Hill, James Hill, over at uh, he worked at, was a writer at Metro, and James and. Sloan were close friends, so I had known Sloan for quite some time before he met Linda and married her. Mm. 
So that's our association socially. Mm. Otherwise, in the studio, we had good times, you know. Ruthie Terry, Ruth Terry and Catalina, the script girl for John Wayne for 17 years. She was his right hand, really. Right. And, uh, and myself, we'd all, three of us would always have lunch together on lunch breaks. Mm -hmm. We were the close friends. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ruthie and my friendship has lasted all this time. As a matter of fact, I've got to call her. Um, she lives down in Palm Desert in mm -hmm. Rancho Mirage. Mm -hmm. And Catalina's passed on. So that's about the tops of the friendships uh, right. that that were social outside of right. the studio. Right, right. I'm just curious, Peg, when you were working for Republic Pictures, how exactly did you get these roles? Did you, even though you were under contract, did you have to audition for these parts? Was it something where there was a rotation where, okay, Every fourth film is going to be your film, so we're going to, if we have a need for four female leads, you're going to get every fourth one, or, or the third one, or the second or the first. So whenever we come out with a script, it's just on a rotation, we're going to just give out at random the scripts, and it doesn't matter. Or was it where, because you had a contract, they wrote parts for you, and okay, well... Peggy hasn't done a movie in a while or hasn't done a, a serial in a while. We need to write her apart because we have her under contract. You know, I, I'm confused here. How exactly were you cast in some of these roles that you played when you were under contract to Republic? Sure, it was a casting man at the time, but uh, they just, uh, he just called me. He says, uh, okay, Peggy says, you start on this and this date and mm -hmm. next week, and he says, it's a Red Rider. Come pick up the script. Mm. So... And that's what happened. How I left the studio was uh, I had done Son of Zero, or Mark right. of Zero, right. and uh, Antrim called and said, uh, "Okay, got another Zero that right. you're doing. Come pick up the script." And I said, "I don't want to do a serial." Right. And uh, I said, "They're so boring. God, you wear the same costume off for right. three to four right. weeks, the same hairdo." Uh, it, I don't want to do a serial, do westerns, but not right. serials. Right. So he told Al Wilson, the uh, vice president uh, at the time, Yeats was in New York, and uh, Wilson called me, and I told him the same thing. He said, well, Peggy, he said, uh, Mr. Yeats will be back here tomorrow, and he said, you'll have to talk with him because uh, he'll either suspend you Mm -hmm. or I'll let you go, I would imagine. And my contract was like uh, everybody else is just about over there. It was uh, prorated so that they paid me for 12 months. I worked 12 months, too. Uh, paid me for 12 months. Otherwise, uh, your contract is really just nine months, and three months they don't pay you. Right. So... I had mine prorated, and I think it was 72 cents a week. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but Yates got back in town, and I went, and I was in his office, I guess, about an hour and 15 minutes, right? He couldn't be sweeter. He was like my father, mm -hmm. uh, telling me how cold the world was out there and mm -hmm. so forth. Uh, so forth. Right. And I was explaining to him the kind of movies I'd come from when I started doing westerns and and what I'd like to be doing again. And uh, I had no being so innocent and young about the world. I, I had no fear of it at all. So he said, well, Peggy, I'm afraid we're going to have to let you go. And I said, okay. So I was very happy about it. Mm. Peg, why didn't you like working on the cliffhanger serials at Republic? Because, as I say, they were so boring. Golly, Ned, with the Western, you know, you were through in five days. You did that whole story, and boom, you got another little story and another w little dress to wear, another wardrobe. You could change your hairdo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Right, right. Some more guest actors uh, that would come on that you hadn't seen or didn't know, and uh, it was fun. Right. 
front right. where the cereals were. Oh, God, would this thing ever get through? Mm-hmm. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. Whenever I hear somebody talk about the cliffhanger cereals at Republic, anyone who ever worked on a cereal, they always talk about the thickness of the script. They, they always talked about how there was a lot of things going on in those scripts. Oh, gosh, yes. But for the girl, in a cereal, it was just uh, how many different ways can you gasp? Mm, you right. know, it's, oh, <laughs> oh. So <laughs> I said, no, I don't want to do those things. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Okay. And and uh, also, I liked riding. I loved to ride, and I had more of a chance to do that. Uh, as a matter of fact, on one of sunsets, and I don't know the name of it, uh, Tommy Carr, the director. Mm-hmm. But right. anyhow, the girl. Uh, you know, you remember a show Ella Raines did, Tall in the Saddle? Sure. Yeah. Uh, this mm-hmm. girl in this sunset script was a lot like to Ella Rain's Tall in the mm-hmm. Saddle. She could shoot the gun and she could ride the horse, and so uh, I had done it, mm-hmm. and I I liked it. And uh, then up comes the idea of doing a serial that was just so nothing, you know. Right. And uh, I didn't want to do it. Right, right. I didn't see the sense it. As I say, Linda was known as a serial queen. Right, right. And uh, let Linda do it, or let somebody else do it. Mm-hmm. But uh, no, they I, they said you you are gone, and I said okay. Mm-hmm. Right, right. It wasn't too long after that that uh, westerns began to fade. They had them on television, but they began to fade, you know. And again, I was quite surprised. I thought I'd break the chain of Westerns because I didn't know that there was any kind of a name or popularity in them. And uh, I thought it'd be easy to break the chain, but all the calls I got when I left the studio were for Westerns, either Universal or Columbia or Mm -hmm. someplace. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was continuing that, and I thought, oh, boy, I wish I could do something else. I didn't know anything else but acting. So I took a three-day course down in Los Angeles to become a sales girl at the Broadway Hollywood. And uh, they were hiring me for uh, to work in the glove department. The morning I had my hand on the knob of the front door to go to work at Broadway Hollywood, and they're lucky because I didn't know how to make out those sales slips, mm-hmm. uh, this woman, that buck my husband knew, was a, a lady that worked like a script gal over at uh, NBC when NBC was on Sunset. Mm-hmm. She did all the Jimmy Durante shows and Jerry Lewis shows and those things. And so June Leff was her name, and she'd been fighting and fighting with NBC to try and get a casting office. CBS had a casting office, Playhouse 90 and all of that, but NBC didn't have a casting office. So finally, NBC gave... uh, uh, that department, the casting department to June. Well, bless goodness, if I'd met her about twice, she didn't call me. As I say, just as I was leaving, I say, Peggy, how would you like to be an assistant casting director? And I said, oh, my Lord, I'd love it. So I, that's it. I got in the car, went to NBC, and started being a casting director. I don't know anything about office uh, uh, work, nothing. Just all I knew was actors. Mm -hmm. So anyhow, uh, I was with them for three years, yeah. Mm -hmm. When Buck and I got married during those three years and uh, I was going to have my first child, a girl. And a week before Abby was born, I left the office and to have her and... uh, then after I had her a couple of weeks after, I phoned Junie. I said, Junie, uh, my time's up. 
with casting. I mm-hmm. said, I, I don't, I'm not going to do this anymore. Right. She said, I knew that. And I said, how did you know that? She said, I don't know. I just right. knew that. And by that time, it had been just June and me. By that time, our casting office had grown to uh, five casting people. Gene Reynolds was one of them, and Ralph Acton was one of them. Uh, we had our own uh, uh, pay man, mm-hmm. payroll man. Right, right. Because, oh boy, to make up those contracts of after was something else. It was the after was just being born, and they would right. change their rules like every right. other day. Right. And uh, so uh, it was a big size casting office by then. We had uh, Hallmark and uh, uh, mm, I don't know all the shows, or not all the variety shows still. And uh, I have had it. I found myself uh, my office then. I had a, my own little office. And I could see down the hall when you first enter the uh, hallway where all the offices were. And I could see an actor coming to interview for maybe um, mm, oh, I forget the name of the show. It was a it was a very popular one, and it was a drama show. We do good scripts like Wuthering Heights and so forth. So anyhow. Uh, when the actor would start down, I I would categorize them. I didn't even know them. Mm-hmm. And I would categorize them. I said, no, this is no good. I'm getting the skin of a crocodile on me in this business world. And I don't want that. I don't want to lose the sensitivity of an actor. And uh, so anyway, she, she, she knew about it, and that was that. And... Uh, about, oh, three weeks, month later, a man, Jim Lister, called me. Mm-hmm. Jim had been an agent that would come up and see us about different shows for his actors and all. He had quit agenting and had become a uh, casting director with Lynn Stallmaster. So it was Stallmaster Lister. Mm-hmm. And he called, he said, Ben, he said, uh, how would you like to do... Uh, another show and I said oh I'd love it Jim God how wonderful so he said well come on over to California Studios and pick up the script so I go to California Studios and I'm busy talking to Jim the whole time I didn't really look at the script and uh, when that was through and I go back to the car look at the script and here it is a gun smoke I was right back up right. on the darn <laughs> wagon again that I'd spent three years in casting trying to get out of. So I didn't get out of really a thing. And I thought, boy, you know, the creator really, really has you in mind if you just shut up and listen and be guided. Peggy, you worked on many Western TV shows. You worked on The Roy Rogers Show, The Gene Autry Show, The Cisco Kid, The Range Rider, Have Gun Will Travel, The Life and Legend of Wyatt Earp, Gunsmoke, The Rebel, Daniel Boone. The list goes on and on of Western TV shows you worked on. So I'm just curious, what was your favorite show to work on? I can't, I can't say because there were so many. Really and truly. You know, uh, even the Cisco kids, Duncan, right, right. Ronaldo, mm-hmm. that was, uh, l- he's such a sweetheart. And uh, naturally, the Republic shows, uh, Sunset and Bill, right. I adored. I adored him. Right, right. And I loved working with Lash. Mm-hmm. Though I didn't get to know him, as I say, on the shows. But uh, I just loved it. Right. I loved the whole atmosphere and every Monday was location time up at Iverson's Ranch and uh, oh in the winter time Mike there the uh, uh, Romies and Pearls little pickup truck and they had built a little house like thing on the back of their pickup truck and had a butane I would imagine stove in there and they'd make fried eggs and a uh, fried egg and onion sandwiches and you when you went out uh, to Chatsworth you could start
stop smelling <laughs> those right. fried eggs and right. onion things. The memory of that is so wonderful. And then as you got up closer and, and on to the old dirt uh, insert road and all, and the horse trucks were up there in the wintertime, the horses had their winter coats on, uh, the hair on them, and there's a smell about the horsey hair that was, it was like toast, and it was so wonderful. I just thought, oh, thank goodness, you know. And then they get up closer to Romy's truck for your sandwich, and uh, all around the truck was wet. Everything else was just dust, and uh, it was wet from... Uh, either turpentine or kerosene that he'd get out and pour around the truck because it was red ants up there at Iverson's Ranch. They were big enough to saddle and boy, they'd sting. Mm -hmm. So you'd be standing there getting your sandwich and mm -hmm. this uh, kerosene or turpentine would keep right. it from crawling up your boots anyhow. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. During the time you were making westerns, is there an actor who you never got a chance to work with who you would have loved to have worked with? Yes, Clint Eastwood. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Right. I just, uh, I'm such a fan of his, and this book that I told you about is mm. marvelous. And they, sorry, Peg, I didn't mean to cut you off. They never offered you a, a spot on Rawhide. They never came to you. No, uh, <laughs> I was busy on other things, and not to my knowledge, anyhow. Okay. I, I never got any outside because there was one when I was at Republic for Brenda Marshall, who was married to Bill Holden. Mm -hmm. She was under contract to Warner Brothers, and she was doing a picture, a movie, uh, where she was a twin. And Warner said, mm -hmm. called, and, and Brenda and I looked very much alike. And uh, when uh, Warner Brothers from Republic wanted to know if they would loan me out, to play her twin sister, and they said no. If I was working, they needed me there, so that's the only call that I know of I got. Okay, okay. Peggy, tell me about your horse, Smokey. How did you get oh, Smokey's horse? Oh, what a horse? doll. Yeah. He's so cute, honest to Pete. Uh, all the horses were wonderful over there, Mike. They, they, um, they're so smart. They're so smart. It's like the animals on the shows now, dogs and everything. But the horses, uh, Smokey, they, at, the, at the running insert road out of Joe Iverson's ranch that we would have location at on every Monday, there was a hill that the camera car would sit on. And then when we were going to shoot the scene, do the running insert, at the top of the hill, there was a little bitty circle that was bare that the horses had made. And it's because we would walk the horses around and around in a circle to keep them from uh, being so darn excited. They would hear the camera car turn on and rev up. It would rev itself up high to get up that uh, small part of the hill and then it would be at full speed by the time it got on the level part and so we would circle the horses around and when they'd pass us boom we'd let the horses out and follow the camera car and uh, uh, Smokey he knew all of this too and he was very spirited just a doll and he he was uh, hmm I don't know really how to, how tall he was. Maybe he was not not pinto size, but uh, average size, not big. And he had a he was a little Arabian, and he had a small tummy, you know. So my legs, I loved uh, uh, when I was in Atlanta showing horses. Um, I rode English all the time, mm -hmm. so. I had a mixture of writing both Western and English, and I liked a long stirrup where my toe barely touched the uh, stirrup, and I'd sit out a trot most of the time rather than post it. And that way, and I kept elbows to my side, no flapping elbows, and sit up straight. And that, to me, was the way Joe McRae and Gary Cooper, Errol Flynn, these boys rode that I thought looked so pretty on 
a horse. And uh, Smokey, anyhow, he knew this one time, and uh, he we did the running insert. Insert. In fact, that's that's the only picture I have of him riding him. Um, whoever Tommy Carr, whoever the director was, says, uh, "Pull him back, Peg. You're up too close. Up too close." So I pulled him back, and it's uh, the picture has got Smokey's head. Uh, flaring up straight up he didn't have on a hackamore mm -hmm. and his nostrils are inflated you know and uh, he's just riding hill bent for election galloping so we did the shot and uh, the saving the driver for the uh, camera car he had slowed up and i knew the shot was over with smokey keeps going mm -hmm. well i can pull him he's Good. He, he was wonderful. Nothing. Right. No stopping. He kept <laughs> going, tearing down the street. I pulled, and I shortened the range. I leaned forward in the saddle. I got the range almost up to the to the bridle and just uh, the, to the bit, and pulled nothing. Couldn't get his head to tuck. I pulled on just the right rein to see if I could get his head turned sideways. Nothing. And just before the insert road stops, he stops, he slows down. Well, I ride him back to the truck, and again, John Goodwin, the Wrangler. I said, John, I don't know what the heck's wrong with Smokey. Is he spit in his mouth right or what? And I said, or tighten the curb chain. John said, I saw you having a little trouble there. He always called me Gertrude. I saw you having a little trouble there, Gertrude. He said, uh, let me tell you a trick. And I said, okay. He said, if any horse gets a bit in his mouth and takes off with you again, he said, you take those reins and you cross them right across his withers, mm -hmm. right in front of the saddle. Get them short, cross them, and just lean on them. Just pull them straight down. That'll bring his head down. And when his head's down, he can't see where he's going, so he'll mm -hmm. stop. Right. So I said, oh, John, thank you so much, you know. And uh, Smokey never did take off again, but his bit had gotten underneath his tongue where it wasn't doing him any good, you know. Right, right. <laughs> so, but Omaha, Omaha, another one that they had at Huckin' Stables. We used Huckin' Stables all the time. Right. And uh, Omaha was was a racehorse. Polly Burson, the stunt girl, she took him down to Caliente and raced him. And he came in third down there. But... Uh, Omaha looked like a nag, just a real nag. Right. And on the Western Street, on one of the Westerns, I was back talking to Buddy Sherwood and Johnny Goodwin. Sherwood says, uh, have you ever watched Omaha? Uh, up at the hitching post, Omaha was with some other horses. So the AD had said, okay, cowboy, you, 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 take a horse. They all walk down the street. And so this guy walks over to Omaha, and Omaha immediately uh, leans on one hip way over. It was a hot day, and his tail was swatting flies. So the cowboy pulls him back off of the hitching rack, mm -hmm. gets on him, just walks him down the street to get the feel a little bit, and Omaha's limping. And cowboy gets off, he looks at his hoof, Everything funny, he walks the Omaha back over to the Wranglers. He said, sure, what? He said, this horse got uh, a little soft foot here. So Sherwood said, oh, that's too bad. You know, you looked at his hoof, no rock in it, no nothing. So he said, well, okay, we'll get you another horse. And so he took it, Sherwood took over her and put him back over on the uh, hitching rack. Mm -hmm. Omaha right. walks over to that hitcher rack, though nothing's wrong. As soon as he gets over there, he gives over on that hip again, goes back to sleep. Right. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't want to work. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so there's so many of those horse stories, I tell you, they're smart. They're smart animals. Right, right, right. <laughs> between the 
states brought evil to the great west. Daring desperados ran rampant, pillaging, robbing and terrorizing, endangering peaceful citizens, attacking wagon trains, until a masked rider appeared like a ghost from the past to challenge these bad men and bring them to justice. He was the fearless son of Zorro. In terms of westerns, I've pretty much seen everything you were ever in over the course of your career. I've pretty much seen all the western movies, the western TV shows, and the western cliffhanger serials you made during your career. So, my three favorites are The Phantom Rider, Stagecoach to Denver, and my all-time favorite thing that you were ever in is Son of Zorro. I mentioned in the opening that when I think of you, I think of you as Kate Wells in Son of Zorro. I really love that serial. It's a great serial. It's got action. It's got a great story. I I really enjoy that. Obviously, anything with Roy Barcroft, like I mentioned earlier, sign me up for. I really enjoy him. Uh, Tom London, all all these other guys do a great job in that particular serial. And I I really enjoy uh, watching that one. I've, I've seen it probably a thousand times, but every time it's still, it's still enjoyable for me. So, That's my favorite all-time thing that you ever made. So I'm just curious, what was it like making Son of Zorro? What what do you remember about making that serial? I don't know, because they they all uh, mold in my head. They all blend together. Okay. Like, is that the one where I'm dropped into a well? Yes, yes, that is. That's the one. Is it? Yep. Yeah, well, that was the only thing really I remember. Mm -hmm. It was a... Big bucket, big, right. big bucket mm-hmm. inside that well. Mm-hmm. And on the bottom of the bucket was a handle. So they had told me that when I got down into the water, to stay down because uh, there was a scene going right. on up out of the water, of course. Right. And to grab the handle and uh, keep myself down because your clothes will float. Mm-hmm. So I did. I, we get seen. I take a deep breath and down we go. I'm holding my breath and I'm holding it and holding it and holding it. And I'm a swimmer, so I, I said, God, I cannot hold it anymore. What are they doing up there, you know? <laughs> and I said, to heck with it. I'm just going to bust the scene up. So I let go of the handle and came on up, you know, and right. was ready to say, what's happening? And nobody is there. Right. No, no camera, no nothing. Nobody is there. Just me in that darn bucket. And I look over to the side and hear all the crew and everybody's just standing there with their arms crossed and they're just laughing away. Right, right. <laughs> I, just, I could have drowned there. Right, 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 <laughs> yeah. right, right. So that's the only thing I remember mm-hmm. about that mm-hmm. serial. I'm very happy that you remember that particular scene from Son of Zorro because that's the cliffhanger for Chapter 8 in Son of Zorro. They stick you down that well because Roy Barcroft's character is trying to make you tell them who Zorro is and Zorro shows up and they they have a little fight. Roy Barcroft's character and Dale Van Sickle fight Zorro and then a bucket gets thrown and it knocks, it knocks you back down into the well, and and that's the cliffhanger. We don't know if Zorro's going to reel you back up or if you're going to drown in that well. So I'm very happy that you remember that particular scene. Now, I'm just curious, um, who exactly is George Turner? He didn't have a long career. Yeah, who is that guy? He didn't have a long career, and and there's no information about him anywhere. I know it, and uh, on the festival, some people have... Uh, asked others when I'm standing there, you know, do you know him? Nobody knows him. Nobody knows where he is or if he is. He does a, a pretty good job in that serial, but he, he just disappeared. I know it. That's, that's <laughs> yeah. So I haven't the slightest idea, honey. Okay, okay. I, re- I really wanted to, to get that because, you know, like I said, there, there's no information on him. We don't know if, if, he, if, he, if he died, if he's alive, when he was born, uh, what he did, why did he leave acting, you know, and there's no information on him. So I really, really wanted to hear about him. So anyways, Peggy, a couple more questions before I let you go, and I, I really appreciate you being so generous with your time. I know this has been a very long interview. Just a couple more questions here. If we were to make a movie based on your life, what current Hollywood 
actress would play you in this movie? Who would play you in a movie about your life? I've never thought of that, Mike. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. No, because no. there's an awful lot of them that I don't even remember their names. You know, they come up. Like, uh, S.A.G. just sent me stuff uh, to consider as a nomination for uh, the awards. And, um, gosh, some of them I don't know. I've never heard of. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Fair enough, fair enough. I'm just curious, when was the last time you sat down and watched a Western movie, a Western TV show, or a Western cliffhanger serial that you made during your career? When was the last time you just sat down and watched some of your old work? I have never done that. Really? Why not? I, well, in the first place, uh, I just I just never did it. Fans have sent me so many different films, and I I uh, I haven't done it. I guess because I'm busy watching the films they're making today. <laughs> mm, right, right. <laughs> and then uh, when I was at Republic, uh, I never had a chance. Mm -hmm. There was that little western theater across the street from Pantages Theater called The Hitching Post mm. and I never had a chance to get over there I was working on Saturdays Sunday was the only time off and I was usually with Mike, my son mm. okay, okay that's interesting now is this just the westerns or is this your whole career have you, have you never have you ever watched anything that you've made, whether it was a Western, non-Western? Have you ever watched anything that you made? No, uh, I caught uh, That's My Boy with Adam Sandler. Right. They had a preview of it over in Westwood. So um, they invited the cast and people mm. that were there, so I went to see that. Yeah. Okay, okay, interesting. interesting. And, uh, yeah, that's the only one. Mm. That's the only one. Oh. I, I just, uh, I don't know, I just miss them. Mm. Uh, there was a serious, there's a couple, two I would have liked to have seen because it's the first time I'd done any comedy. Uh, one was called Yes, Dear. It was a series, and uh, I would have liked to have seen that because after that, uh, I've gotten called several times for comedy. And that surprises me. I had never done it. Mm. Okay, okay. I see, I see. Now, Peggy, I've enjoyed every minute of this interview. This has been an absolute honor and a privilege to speak with you today. From the bottom of my heart, thank you for taking the time to talk. I really appreciate it. And I think the same thing. You've been a wonderful interviewer, and uh, it was it took me back down memory lane, and I thank you for that. <laughs> I love the, all the stories. I love the and just just getting into memory lane again. Yeah, it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, privilege and honor. And I, I thank you, Mike, very much. Thank you, Peggy. I really appreciate that. That means a lot coming from you. This was great. I could talk to you all day. This was so much fun talking about your career and talking about all the great stars that you worked with over the course of your career. Some of my all-time favorites, guys like Lash LaRue, Roy Rogers, Gene Autry, Roy Barcroft, Sunset Carson, Jock Mahoney, talking about all these great Western stars that you worked with during your career. This was so much fun. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk. This was, this was a lot of fun, Peg. Well, gosh, darling, I, I thank you. If it wasn't for you all, I mean, we wouldn't be what, we be what we're doing and what we are. Mm -hmm. So I thank you too, honey. Mm -hmm. this, is a, this is a conversation of mutuality. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, very much so, Mike. Where do you live? I'm from Michigan. Uh, hey, oh, from my Michigan. God, yeah. Mike. You're I'm freezing just right, to hear right. the name. We're snowed in, so it is what you imagine. We're we got a, I think, a four or five inches last night of snow. So we are freezing. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Gosh, oh my! <laughs> well, if you get out this way, give a call, and we'll go have lunch. Oh, oh I will definitely take you up on that offer. That would be awesome. I, I would, I would love that very much. Okay, darling. 
Okay, okay Peg. Um, Thanks again, yeah, Mike. Yeah, really appreciate the time, and uh, you have a wonderful day. Yes, you too.